America's religious landscape has been shifting over the decades. A new study breaks down the impacts of immigration, diversity, and interfaith tensions. It includes West Michigan's approach to bridging religious divides. We'll discuss interfaith engagement on West Michigan Week. And thank you for joining us on West Michigan Week. Our guest today, Gazala Munir, co-founder, Interfaith Dialogue Association, Sheldon Copperell, adult educator at Temple Emanuel, Katie Gordon, program manager, Kaufman Interfaith Institute, and the man who leads the Kaufman Interfaith Institute, Douglas Kinchy. Thank you so much for being here. I find this to be fascinating, especially when you see what's taking place in American culture right now, uh, some of the conflicts, the tensions that are also brought up in, in this document here. This is called the Interfaith Engagement in West Michigan, a brief history and analysis. This is through the, uh, the Aspen Institute for Justice and Society Programming. Talk about the genesis of all of this and, and really how, how this gets us here today. Well, the, <coughs> the document itself <coughs> is a follow-up on an do earlier document that they did on principled pluralism. It was a long-term study, and, and they published that book about three years ago. And when they came to West Michigan and saw what we were doing, the idea came up to do a case study, kind of, what happens in a particular community when you seek to look for interfaith understanding. And so they uh, got the person who wrote the Principal Pluralism Project, uh, Joe DeMott, to stick around an extra year and do the research and the writing of this document. We're really pleased that what we've been doing here in this community is now documented and available all over the country. In each region of the country, uh, there is its own bit of history, right? It, it has its own very unique f religious footprint. And in this community, uh, we, we know that there is that Dutch heritage here, right. uh, the Christian reform community that's here, but the world is changing. So what, what do we yeah. see here in this community, past and present? Well, I think one of the things that's very interesting is that when you think about interfaith and diversity, you tend to think of the coasts. You think of Boston, you think of San Francisco, cities like that. And this is a fairly conservative, predominantly Christian community, but it is becoming more diverse. And I think it's so interesting that we are approaching that diversity in a very healthy way, a very respectful way. I think that's very much to the credit of this community. But let's, let's take a step back now. Okay. We, we look at the Muskegon community and Grand Rapids. Where do we want to start? Well, Develop. Grand Rapids um, started in the early, early 90s. It was just an informal group. And I have to name the two women who started this with me. Um, Jewish woman by the name of Lillian Siegel and Marcin Reenstra, a Christian woman. And we just met and decided that uh, we need to do something here in this community. We have, there is nothing like this that where all the religions come together. So we started meeting um, in living rooms. Our first uh, book that we discussed was um, Houston Smith's uh, Religions of Man, it has changed its name since then. Um, more gender specific now. Uh, actually, it was more gender specific. And now they, they've, I think it's called um, World Religions or something. So we would read um, each religion every week. And we just got in different people's living rooms. We started with like five people. And then we expanded to about 11. It was a vibrant group. Everybody would show up. And there was some wonderful discussions. I mean, there, there are people from different cultural backgrounds, too. So we had Hindus, we had Buddhists, Christians, Muslims, Jews. And I still remember that day that we didn't think it would come this far where it is today. And that makes us, all of us, very excited. Are there rules when you have these meetings and these discussions? Because everybody is going to favor their own religion, sure. and they know that religion much more closely than they know others. Sure. So are there rules when you're having these meetings? That's when you, that what you start with are rules of interfaith dialogue. Uh, it's a document that was put together by, I um, can't remember his name now, at Temple. Uh, and that's when we went with the first thing we read was that particular document. 
and um, so that you respect, you bring out the best of every religion. You don't compare the worst to the worst, but the best to the best. And um, any time we saw, from my experience, anybody who tried to proselytize, they wouldn't stay very long. They would just leave on their own because they realized this was not their place. So only people remained who were very open to knowledge, knowing about other religions. And um, so we started small, but it just uh, is a great delight to see where um, Doug has taken it to. The, <coughs> the rules, there was the dialogue decalogue. Dialogue decalogue. <laughs> it was, it was, it was, it was the Leonard Swidler that put that out. Leonard it was Swidler, the, yes. the Ten Commandments for dialogue. And I think what's interesting, you can encapsulate those rules in three rules that Christer Stendhal laid out for interfaith dialogue. And he was the dean of the Divinity School at Harvard and then later became the bishop of the Church of Sweden. And his three rules, which really are kind of a summary of Swidler's, the first one is learn from adherents, not from enemies. Don't listen to what the enemies of Islam say. Listen to what the practitioners of Islam or Judaism or whatever. Mm -hmm. Learn from the adherents. His second rule is don't compare your best with their worst. It's so easy to find something in the Quran that maybe you will think is very good and ignore, if you're Christian, all of the passages of the Bible that are a little awkward. So that was his second rule. And his third rule was leave room for holy envy. And holy envy he defined as finding something in that other tradition that is so intriguing that your own tradition doesn't really handle that well. And you kind of are envious. When you get to that stage, then you really are understanding that other religion. It's an envy, but he calls it a holy envy. And, and in the report, we talk about diversity. There is, there's greatness in diversity, and then there are those, those tensions that arise. How do, you, mm -hmm. how do we bridge that, those issues that are taking place in the world today? And in particular, after really the attacks of 9-11, we're seeing mm -hmm. a lot more of this, in particular attacks against Muslim and the Muslim and the Islamic mm -hmm. uh, faith. Mm -hmm. How do we bridge that? How do we get that dialogue going? Because there's that suspicion that's out there. Yeah. Well, I think that's exactly it. It's about how to build bridges um, between people of difference. And Ibu Patel, who's the founder of the Interfaith Youth Corps um, and really promotes interfaith leadership among uh, college students, he, what he calls it is building bridges, not barriers. And so what you can do with difference is you can build barriers between you and anyone who is other, who is perceived as other. You can even build a bunker and kind of isolate yourself from difference and live in this community just on its own. But what he say, sees as really important in the more interconnected, globalized sort of world we live in is how do we build bridges between people who are different. And that happens through dialogue and it also happens through service opportunities or cooperation and civic engagement outside of, outside of your own um, religious circle. And we saw that engagement taking place in Muskegon in, mm -hmm. in particular, right? Yeah, I think uh, <coughs> Gazala has told us about what happened in the late 80s and early 90s in Grand Rapids. And a similar thing was happening in Muskegon where Sylvia Kaufman, who the name, the Kaufman Institute is now named after her, but she was a part of a Jewish family in Muskegon and there had been a small Jewish family for about, I mean, there had been Jewish community in Muskegon for about 100 years. And so she decided to organize a centennial of the Jewish community in, in, the, in that area. And she had some wonderful things. She had Ishak Perlman come and give a concert. And but one of the things she did is that she brought two theologians, a Jewish theologian and a Christian theologian. The Jewish theologian was David Hartman, who was the founder and president of the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem, and Christer Stendhal, who I've already mentioned, who was the Bishop of Sweden. And they dialogued all day long. And, and people that went to that first session still talk about some of the things that came out of that, because this was really early in the discussion. And then that was so successful, the people in the community said, you've got to do this again. So they started every three years having a Jewish-Christian dialogue, which now has become a Jewish-Christian-Muslim dialogue. Mm -hmm. And this has been ongoing. We had the year of interfaith dialogue last year. Well, yeah. The, 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 Mus the Muskegon program, when, when the Kaufmans moved to Chicago after he sold, the, or not sold, but he turned the company over to his, to his son, they moved to Chicago and they then came to Grand Valley and said, this program that we've established is so important, we don't want to lose it. So why don't we move it to Grand Rapids and why doesn't Grand Valley take over that process? Mm -hmm. And one thing led to another and then the Kaufman Institute was formed and that's when we established the year of interfaith understanding.
Shell, how, how important is this? As an adult educator at Temple Emanuel, how important is it that we have these conversations? They're not always comfortable conversations, mm -hmm. as you found out, right? <laughs> not but, by any means. but how important <laughs> is it to begin that dialogue? It's extremely important at a couple of levels. First of all, I have been the religious school teacher at Temple Emanuel to our 10th grade class, and the 10th graders get a world religions perspective. We talk in class, and the students, being roughly 16 years old, are old enough to have had opinions, and we talk about the different religions from their Jewish perspective, and when they're interfaith families within the temple, sometimes they will bring up the other parent as well. Then we go visit the different houses of worship around the Grand Rapids area. And by the way, they've all been without exception the most hospitable people you could imagine, and we're trying to reciprocate by inviting their religious school classes to visit Temple Emmanuel, and some of them have. But I think it's important that first of all we try to understand the other religions, especially the Jewish community here in Grand Rapids. We have about 600 families probably. The older of the Jewish mainstream temples here, um, institutions, Temple Emmanuel, to which I belong, was founded a hundred and over 150 years ago. And so it's, there's been a Jewish presence in Grand Rapids for a long time, but the Jewish community tends to be so isolated. And so it really is important for everyone to understand something about the different religions. I know during the year of interfaith understanding, I gave a number of talks at different churches and schools and still do quite a bit of that about Judaism and the temple and the synagogue, the conservative synagogue, Ahavas Israel, put on programs. I know both of us did community seders around Passover time to allow the whole community to see what's involved there. And we also, in our adult education, want to try to promote diversity and understanding among adults as well. So I think it's extremely important, speaking from the position of someone in a minority religion, that we try to share as much as we can and encourage these kinds of events that Kaufman has put on and the Interfaith Dialogue Association that I'm also connected with. I'm secretary treasurer of that. That's the outgrowth of what Ghazala and Lillian and Marcin had started all these many years ago. And the one thing about the Interfaith Dialogue Association is that it has had representatives from all the different religions, not simply the Abrahamic. Right. And we're still working on trying to get that done as well. Is part of the difficulty that as everyone is on their own spiritual journey within their own religion, there is so much to tackle and so much to understand that it's very difficult to maybe even find the time to learn of other religions. And there are so many other religions to mm -hmm. comprehend and to understand the, the seeds and the beliefs of those religions. Is there an easy way for people to really take the time to learn and to get over this religious ignorance that I think is, is out there in our society? I don't know that it's easy, but I think I, picking up on what Shell said, I think is important, is isolation. For centuries, religions have been isolated. <coughs> We've been isolated in countries. We've been <coughs> isolated even in communities. The different religious groups tend to hang together. You, you go to church on a Sunday morning, and that's one of the most segregated hours of the week. You know, we, there's, a, there's a human tendency to want to hang out with people like us. And <coughs> that's a, not only is time an issue, but that, that desire to be with people like yourself is a very strong part of, your, of mm -hmm. developing one's identity. And we have, to, we, have, we have to work against that. We have to realize that identity does not have to divide. Identity doesn't have to be, it's something we can affirm, but we don't have to only be with people just like us. I sometimes say, you don't learn a lot if all you're doing is looking in the mirror. <laughs> and we learn so much when we get involved with people who are different than, than we are. It is so exciting to be part of a diversity program. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and another interesting thing about interfaith too is that sometimes it's viewed as mutually exclusive, so you can either be engaged with interfaith work or in your own community. But really what we find is that people who, based in their own roots, their own tradition, who engage with interfaith work from there, end up learning more about their own tradition through that dialogue. And so engaging with people who come from a different tradition inspires you to dig into your own values or your own beliefs more, so you know how to justify it, how to, how to dialogue, how to share what you believe um, in a positive way. And so really we're seeing a lot of um, faith-rooted and community-rooted um, reasons for engaging in that interfaith work. You know, the studies show that, <coughs> that, that not only are we ignorant about other religions, we're ignorant about our own. Mm -hmm. The, 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 uh, the li religious literacy among Americans, especially among Christians, is very, very low. It's kind of shocking. There's a whole book been written about that that Stephen Prothro uh, is famous for. But, and, and what Ibu Patel says, when you invite people to the interfaith table, you give them permission to talk about their own religion and to learn and, and get deeper in their own religion. Mm -hmm. It's not a matter of getting, you know, all sort of spread out and everybody being the same. It, you, it, enabled, it actually helps your identity to be a part of this. We'll take a quick break and when we come back, more on interfaith dialogue in just one minute. West Michigan. It's part of a new uh, report, a uh, new study that's out through the Kaufman Institute and the Aspen Institute as well. Um, a little history on religion in America and what's taking place now. Are we beginning to see shifts with millennials? There's a new report out by the Pew Research uh, Center that says millennials increasingly are driving growth of nuns, not the ones mm -hmm. that... Not the converts. Right. <laughs> These are the non-religious young people. What's, what's taking place? Mm -hmm. Katie, you're the millennial at the yes, table. Yes, yeah, I am. <laughs> I'll speak for the millennials. Um, yeah, so, you know, America and especially uh, Midwest uh, communities are very Christian-centric um, population-wise. But what we're seeing with the Pew Research across the country, that this trend isn't only happening on the coasts, but also in the Midwest, um, is that more people are identifying as non-affiliated with religion, and then also more people of, um, of non-Christian traditions, um, the communities are rising. So more Muslim communities, more Hindu, more Buddhist, more Jewish communities. Um, and the numbers in general of Christianity is going down and people are leaving the church. And so this is creating a really interesting moment in the interfaith world because um, we're really expanding the idea of who's involved with interfaith. Um, like we saw in, in Muskegon and in Grand Rapids in the early days, um, starting with Christianity and Judaism, and then expanding to Islam, and then expanding to the non-Abrahamic traditions. We also are expanding to include non-religious voices as well, because a lot of secular humanists, atheists, agnostics, um, they want to be involved with these interfaith dialogues because um, they hold the same values that a lot of religious people do as well. Um, around serving each other, serving the community. And I think that that's only enriched interfaith dialogues, really, is having even more perspectives on what brings us together. Is it because, do young people see conflicts and the reason for world conflicts in many cases is based mm -hmm. on religion and religious conflict? Yeah, I think it's a draw away from institutional religion, right? So young people are looking for community and they're looking for belonging, but they're finding it in places outside of the church or outside of institutionalized religion. Um, and I also, I heard a really interesting idea from someone from a, a millennial who actually identifies as Catholic himself, um, that it, it comes from maybe millennials viewing their religious institutions as not living up to the values that they think they should be living up to. Um, so I have a friend who is at Harvard Divinity School and he just published a report on where, where millennials are gathering around, um, around community and a lot of it is multi-faith gatherings. 
Um, so people who come from different traditions who have a lot of differences but find common values, um, which I know is why I'm a part of interfaith work is because I find so many shared values with my friends that come from different traditions than my own. And I find that to be really enriching and um, kind of a way to explore the diversity of our community in a really exciting way. You work with young people as well. Yeah, I find that a number of the students who come up to our religious studies classes at Grand Valley, particularly the intro classes, are very much interested in, many of them come from a strong faith background and still have that strong faith, and they are actually more interested in learning about some of their roots from certainly in my Ju Judaism class but they're also interested in learning about some of the other world religions, just because we are so such a global society now. You almost have to, no matter what your major is, at an institution of higher learning, you need to know something about the religions of the different cultures you're gonna be working with. So our program is strictly the academic study of religion, but a number of our students who were brought up in a very traditional way whether it's Judaism or Christianity or one of the other religions, and who through their years in high school and beginning college years are not necessarily doubting their faith, but they want to learn more about the different religions or taking our classes and finding an interesting opportunity to learn more. And they are, by and large, very comfortable talking about their faith and other faiths with their colleagues and their um, cohorts in these classes. I know that we have uh, a graphic here, uh, religious unaffiliated Americans. Uh, if you go back to the 1960s and 1970s, it was below 10%. Mid-1990s, it doubles to around 20%. And in 2015, 30% of Americans are unaffiliated religiously. I, I think part of the reason is that many people were unconscious religiously. They, 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 they grew up, it was part of the culture, it was part of the background, they didn't really think about it that much. That's why there was so much illiteracy, because it wasn't really something they thought about and dwelt with. And what's happening now is that we're having to be conscious about our religious beliefs. And one way to be conscious about other beliefs and your own is to be involved in these kind of dialogues. It brings it to the forward. It's not just part of the way I was raised and mm -hmm. part of my culture and something I don't have to think about. It's really, a, a, I think, a very valuable thing for all of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're discovering our basic humanity. Right. That's what we're discovering. But we're even seeing these tensions where you have conservative religious types and progressive religious types. Even within a religion, right. you see these things happening. I, why, why are we seeing this, to, especially today? Why now? Well, I think it's actually a long tradition, especially in Protestantism, although Ghazala can speak to the different sects within Islam. But it, what happens is when you have a disagreement, you form a new religion. You form a new identity group. If I don't agree with you about something, then you, we, we're just not in the same club anymore. So I start my own club. And there are something like 500 different Protestant denominations around the country. And every time there's an issue that people disagree on, well, you just start another denomination. I think that's really, really dangerous. So my word of God is different from your word of God? Is that, is that how that works? So that's what people like to think. <laughs> people like to think that my understanding of God's word is the absolute truth. We, rather than saying God is absolute, we'd like to say that my understanding is absolute. Mm -hmm. That's a very dangerous step to take. Mm -hmm. In Islam, there, is, uh, there are two many groups. There's the basic two, the Shia and the Sunni. And that was really a political division. And the theology is absolutely agrees with us. Still, you'll see so much tension between them. And uh, then there are smaller groups. Um, but I'm seeing now that there's people, again, young people, and they're not liking the idea how mosques work. Um, you can see, say, it gender-wise, too, and in many other areas, that they're just, um, they're supposed to listen and do and leave. So um, I just heard. Um, there's a group called Unmasked Muslims. <laughs> so they, they're out of Wisconsin, and they're now spreading. Unmasked. So these uh, people just meet among each other, and you know they do the prayer, and they do the service, and everything. 
but they do it the way they want to do it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Muslims hearing this may not like it, but mm -hmm. um, that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. Similarly, women have um, a mosque starting in Los Angeles. It's mm -hmm. an all-female mosque. So that makes me personally very excited. Uh, and uh, these things are sprouting up everywhere. Mm -hmm. Is this a good thing, Shell, that we see uh, oh. different groups kind of splintering off and doing their own thing? I think it is. I think that the day and age of denominations or movements or whatever you want to call them, these sometimes artificial separations and moving to a post-denominational age, I think is certainly quite, I find quite good. In Judaism, we have the same issue with conservative orthodox and reform, and I do think that it's something that we should encourage. To, All right. Uh, if somebody would like a copy, Doug, they, yes, can, they can contact uh, mm -hmm. the Kaufman absolutely. Institute? Absolutely. You can contact us. Uh, the email is uh, interfaith at gvsu.edu or go to our website, which is interfaithunderstanding.org. All right. We'll thank our guest, Ghazala Munir, co-founder of Interfaith Dialogue Association. Thank, thank you. you. Sheldon Copperell, adult educator at Temple Emanuel. Thank, thank you. you. Katie Gordon, program manager, Kaufman Interfaith Institute. And your boss, Doug yep. Kinchy. <laughs> Thanks for stopping by. We've enjoyed being here, Patrick. Yeah. Thank you. It's always Patrick. fun. Thank you. Fun. Thank you and Patrick. thank you for joining us this week. We'll see you next week on West Michigan Week. That went way too fast. <laughs>